This is Dr. Maureen Young and David. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, he's only two months old, so I gotta bring him. Aww. Is that awesome? <laughs> Nori received her bachelor's um, in zoology from this university, also her master's and PhD <coughs> with a special specialization in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology. She's been a postdoctoral researcher in the Center for Conservation Research and Training. Uh, she is an associate in science at Bishop Museum yeah, and collections manager of malacology and also a research collaborator at Smithsonian Institution. Um, I think I'll just hand it over to you. We are so grateful for you being here today. Talk to us about Hawaiian land snails. Right. All right. How's everyone doing today? Good. 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 Awesome. All right. So let's just get a little bit started with you guys because sometimes after lunchtime everyone's a little bit sleepy, right? So, <laughs> all right. See so if you guys can answer some of these questions. So, how many describe organisms do you think they are in, in the world that we know of? 1.5 million. 1.5 million species. What? That's pretty good. Yeah, so about 1.5 to about 1.9. Anyone can tell us what the largest animal phylum is? Insects. Yeah, insects belong to that phylum, but what's the phylum? Animalia? No, that's a kingdom. Arthropods, arthropoda, exactly. And the second largest? <laughs> Mollusca, yes. So there are about a million species in Arthropoda and about 200,000 species in Mollusca. Today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about Mollusca. So here's something um, that I wanted to show you guys that yes, there's about 1.5 to 1.9 million described <coughs> organisms that we know of. Um, and so, but unfortunately, most of the knowledge that we have are the birds, mammals, reptiles, and they only encompass about 2.8% of, of the known diversity. Uh, so we call it the <coughs> megafauna, the charismatic megafauna, because a lot of these other things that pretty much make up the world, we know very little about. So hopefully today I can give you some um, knowledge of some of the invertebrates that we have in the world, and hopefully you guys will see how important they are um, in keeping the biodiversity and our ecosystems healthy. So mollusks, the second largest animal phylum, about 100 to 200,000 described species. They have a long evolutionary history, um, almost 500 million years. So they have a lot of history that they can um, teach us about. Um, it's a very diverse fauna. You can find them almost on all the continents as well as the oceans. Um, and they've adapted to various habitats from marine, aquatic, to terrestrial systems. So this is one of the rare taxonomic groups that has been able to adapt to so many habitats and all over the world. So in, in mullets, um, you have things like the squid, you have the slugs and the, <coughs> the slugs and the snails, um, bivalves, clams, mussels, they all belong in Alaska. Today though, I'll be talking to you about the gastropods. Uh, that's about 60% of Alaska, um, and they include the land snails, marine snails, and slugs that you see over here. So you can see that they have a wide range of colors, sizes, and again, they have um, adapted to many different types of habitats. Um, and they can be really puny, about like 1.5 millimeters. That's like the size of a rice grain, or even smaller than that. To something this large, this is a marine snail, 91 centimeters. So that's about this high in shell length. So just, just you know, a wide range of sizes. It also has a lot of different reproductive adaptations. So some are oviparous, oviparous, sorry, um, and so some of them have live births, some of them lay eggs, and these are all different types of adapt um, adaptations so that they can invade all types of ecosystems and habitats. Okay, so now you know I've told you a little bit about about the, the diversity of mollusks, but so what? There's a lot of them out in, in the world. Are they important? Do, yes. do we even care about them? Yes. Why? Um, I'm sure they play an important role in like the food chain and that sort of thing. Yeah, so they probably yeah do have a good um, component in the food web and food chain. Any other reasons why they are important? Oh, in the back. Yeah. Yeah, you. Yeah, so um, you're important in the food like the nails or the fish or how this came to the Yes. 
Okay, so they are a food source. Um, they are very good at decomposers, and they are good at bile indicators. You guys got it right on the money. So yeah, so food sources. This is a snail kite um, in um, that is throughout South America as well as the um, southern United States, and they eat this apple snail here. Um, this is the Hypothocoma oleaginosa. This is an endemic moth in Hawaii, and it has a really cool out of feature. So this is one of the few moths that actually is carnivorous. It's called molluscivora because it eats our native land snails. So this is a really cool two species that have evolved in Hawaii and has some really cool ad um, adaptations. And here are some um, references if you guys are interested in understanding how um, invertebrates as well as snails play a very vital role <coughs> in your um, decomposition. So they're basically our garbage men, right? As um, you guys will learn, island ecosystems don't have a lot of um, high nutrient turnovers or nutrients to start off in the first place. We're in the middle of the ocean, right? Most of the nutrients we do get is from the lava as well as from seabird poop, right? So we do need a lot of these invertebrates to break down these nutrients so they can go back to the ground and the plants can reuse them. So they're very, very important as bio indicators as well as keeping our ecosystem healthy. Um, there have been a lot of studies that show that in areas that have a high diversity of snails, we also have a healthy ecosystem. So that like um, the gentleman in the back said, they're very good um, bio indicators. <coughs> Another thing that's really important, especially in Hawaii, is um, of cultural needs. So throughout the Pacific, um, shells historically have been used as, um, as for decoration for money. In Hawaii, we use the kauri for the, um, the octopus lure. So even the shells have a rich history um, in the Hawaiian culture and throughout the South Pacific as well as other parts of the world. And um, this is uh, quite a fad in the last couple of years in Asia where they use snail slime to cleanse your face. So I haven't tried this and I don't think I will. I, you know, uh, just water and a good scrub is good enough for me. I don't need some snail slime. But some people say this actually works. It exfoliates well and you get really soft, smooth skin. So if anybody tries this, let me know if it actually works. But um, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> so, but they taste good. I'll eat them though. <laughs> um, unfortunately, even though they um, you know, have a rich history of um, uh, evolutionary history, they're cool to study scientifically. Um, they have a lot of good history and importance culturally also. Unfortunately, most of these snails are going extinct faster than we can even record them. And this is a paper by Renee et al. in 2009, and, and she had a couple of other papers that just came out last year that has demonstrated that um, these uh, snail groups are going, you know, going extinct really, really quickly. Uh, the majority of the these extinctions are the terrestrial snails, land snails, and most of these extinctions are happening on Pacific islands, things like in Hawaii, Tahiti, Fiji, Samoa. So here we have three um, hotspots throughout the Pacific. We're in the Polynesian hotspot here, They're right above here. There are uh, more than 6,000 species of land snails on these Pacific islands. And majority of them are endemic to a particular island. So anyone want to give me the definition of endemic? They can only, uh, sorry. They only live on that island and nowhere else. Yeah, so and then so and the Mississippi, so they um only are found in one location and nowhere else in the world. So a lot of these are island endemics, if not mountain endemics. So once they're gone, they're gone from the entire world, unfortunately. <coughs> and in Hawaii, we have about one seventeen hundred of the landmass of US and Canada. And we have almost as many numbers of land snails as it does in north of um, Mexico. So just imagine that such a small landmass we have in Hawaii, we have such a rich diversity of <coughs> land snails here. And all of them, the majority of them are endemic to Hawaii. So we have about 750 species. Um, for some counts, it can go up to about 1,400, depending um, on how you classify the species. 99% endemicity. So all but about four are indigenous. So, so we have a really cool uh, community of land snails here. Unfortunately, just like Renee et al. showed in her paper, 
we have about 50 to 90 percent extinction depending on the family. So I'm going to be going over some of these uh, families for you and to just uh, give you a hint of some of the cool things we can do with the land snails in Hawaii as well as um, some of their conservation status. Okay, so before we do start conserving them, or actually anything in general, what are some of the information we need to know before we can um, organize or make conservation plans? Habitat. Habitat. What else do we need to know? What they eat. What they eat. What eats them. Yep. So what eats them? Um, the predators and the prey. Anything else? Co-species. Co-species. Right. So, yeah, so we need to know historical institutions. <coughs> so where were they found before? Where are they now? Um, what are some of the threats that are um, causing their extinction or their decrease? God, <coughs> biodiversity, what are they related to? You know, what is the closest um, um, relations? Where are the populations and how are they uh, connected to each other? And the ecological world. You know, are they a food source for some animals? Uh, what do they eat? So we need to know a lot about these things before we can even attempt to conserve them. So, um, so I'm part of a um, team of researchers that is trying to collect as much information of um, Hawaiian land snails so that we can start conserving them so that they are not all extinct in a decade or two decades. So over the last 10 years, we've uh, been surveying throughout the main Hawaiian Islands. We've got over 800 sites <coughs> trying to search high and low for what is the remnants of um, the land snails here. And we've been collecting habitat um, preferences, you know, if they are on, on Ohia. Um, this is, this is a, one of the rare high elevation bogs <coughs> on Maui, um, as well as trying to understand their life history. Um, until we started documenting them, we, we didn't know a lot of times what the keiki looks like, um, how large they were, if they laid eggs, or even if they gave live birth. So we need to be collecting a lot of this data for a lot of these snails. And then we also have to work in museums because a lot of the experts um, are dead. Uh, so <coughs> a lot of these snails haven't been studied for about 50 to 70 years, some of them over 100 years. So a lot of the data that we are trying to mine are in these are in these museum specimens. I mean, in these museum collections. Um, and so I work at the Bishop Museum. And then if you guys are interested in seeing some of the collections of, of of Hawaii, whether it's birds, plants, or even snails, just let me know afterwards, and then we can talk about whether you want to um, help us volunteer and help us um, maintain the collections because we're always looking for help to um, help us. Uh, data mine a lot of these collections so that we can give to researchers for conservation efforts. Another thing that we're um, utilizing is morphology. So here is the um, top of the shell, the shell sculpture. So um, all the snails are born with a shell. So they're not like hermit crabs where they can you know, swap shells if they don't like their shell. They're born with these shells. And so that's another thing when it comes with conservation management is um, you see a lot of the shell lays that are being sold in Walmart and ABC store. Unfortunately, a lot of times those uh, shells come from live snails. So they would mine the beaches for these shells, kill the snails just for the shells. Um, and so a lot of times they're like, oh, they're invertebrates. They're not all you know, cute and fluffy and it's okay to kill them. So just be mindful that when you see the lays, you should know where it comes from because a lot of times they will kill the snail just for the shells. <coughs> and there are still a lot of shell collectors out there um, wanting the shell but not the snail. Another thing that we are um, examining are the teeth. So this is, um, <coughs> this is a leaf decomposer. So you can tell by the shape of the teeth they're a little bit sharper to cut the leaves. This guy here um, is a fungivore. So it's um, scraping off fungus off of the plant. So even the the teeth can give us some um, idea of what they eat and where they live. So it's pretty cool. And these are SEM um, um, images of these snails. And we also have to look at the reproductive anatomy as well as using ge um, genetics. <coughs> we have to use different types of tools because if we just use one, then we're not very good at assessing the species level. So if we only use shells, you might think there's maybe about two, three, even six different species here. 
but with genetics and in internal morphology, this is all just one species. And then you have something like this that looks kind of similar to each other, right? <coughs> so past species were stopped, this was auricular ambusta, spread all over the YNIs. But we found out through internal morphology as well as the shell morphology that, guess how many species are here? Four. Three. Yeah, so, so we need a lot of data to help us understand the relationship among um, these snails. So uh, now we're gonna go through several of the different families. We're gonna start off with just the family as a whole. Uh, so this is the Cylomotopherin tree, which is like the land snail tree of the entire world. Uh, one thing that you can see, well these are representatives of the Hawaiian families. They're spread <coughs> throughout this tree here. So it's not just one group of snail that has colonized Hawaii. There are multiple different types of families from all over this tree, different evolutionary histories, different life histories, different habitats <coughs> that, that they live in that is widespread and has colonized Hawaii, so that's pretty cool. Um, there are only 10 families in Hawaii. Does anyone know what a disharmonic fauna means? Something that you guys will be learning in the chapters down the road. So some of these concepts, um, hopefully I'll be introducing to you now so that when you revisit it, you have you know some idea of what it means. So anyone know what disharmonic or want to stab at it? Yeah. It's not a wide representation of a lot of families from where the colonizers came from. So we have just a small sampling. Yes. So this harmonic means it's a small proportion <coughs> of the fauna from where the source material came from. So a lot of continents um, have maybe triple the amount of families. So the source population has a large um, diversity of families, but it's this harmonic in Hawaii because only a few colonizations happen to Hawaii. And it's not it's just a snail. It happens with the plants as well as um, all the animals. So there are about 21 colonizations that we know of at the moment. Um, and from the 10, I mean from these 21 colonizations, we have <coughs> over 750 species. So they, we call that a radiation. All right, so we're gonna start with a master date. Um, this is a Hawaiian endemic. The whole entire family is endemic to Hawaii. And I think there were only three endemic families in Hawaii. There was a plant uh, and a bird family. Both of them are unfortunately extinct. So the only remaining um, endemic family that we have in Hawaii is a Amastridae. This was also the family with the most number of species of snails. We used to have 325. Um, unfortunately, 95% are extinct. We have about 17 species that we know of. So out of 325, only 17 left. And so if we don't conserve these 17, this is gonna be the last endemic family um, that is going to be gone from Hawaii. Um, these are primarily epigeal. Anyone know what epigeal means? Anyone know what arboreal means? Trees, exactly. So epigeal is opposite. It's um, they're primarily found in leaf litter, in low um, um, plants, but prim uh, primarily in the soil and the dirt. And so whatever is left are the ones that were historically most abundant. So that kind of makes sense, you know, if you had a lot of them to start off with, a lot of individuals to start off with, you know, um, after habitat destruction and, and, and other threats, you know, that's probably what is um, left. And most of them are on Oahu, and that also makes sense because the highest diversity was also recorded on Oahu. And, we, and these are really spectacular Looking. So if you guys want to see that in the collection, please let me know again and you can come and visit. The Akitanella Day um, is another family. This is the second most species family in Hawaii. There are about 200 species. Um, these, these are found throughout the um, Pacific with a couple in the Indian Ocean. Uh, this is a scale bar. Um, each of them is about one millimeter. So they're re they can be really tiny, about one millimeter to about 15 millimeters. So they have a wide range of sizes. And as you can see, you know, they have different colorations and such. So um, this one is the Akitanella. Some of you may heard it. It's the Kakamuli snail or the tree snail. <coughs> and so a lot of people collected them um, back in the late 1800s, 1900s. So if you go to the museum collections, you will see cabinets and cabinets full of these shells. And you're like just wondering, did you have to collect that many? 
So when you go to a lot of the other museums in the mainland, it's the same thing. So just imagine how many of them were there on these trees, and a lot of them are not around anymore. So there used to be a hundred of these species of these Epitonellas, and there's about 11 left. And it's very similar for these other subfamilies too. So, but there is some um, good news is that as we're doing some of our surveys, uh, we are finding things called cryptic species. Cryptic species are things that uh, morphologically, they're indistinct, in uh, we can't really tell morphologically, sorry, I can't pronounce that today. Um, so as you can see here, they look all very familiar, uh, you know, similar to each other when you look at just the shell conchology, right? So when you put in the genetics as well as the internal morphology, we're, we're, tr we're now figuring out that there are multiple species that actually look alike, right? And so here too, we have this species here and this species here. They, um, one is found in the Wyanites and one is found in the Koalau, and they thought it was the same species, but they're actually very, very different from each other. So even though they look um, similar to our eyeballs, um, they're actually very different to each other. So this is one thing that uh, you can definitely um, investigate if you study Hawaiian land snails. Endodontics. All right, let's see how good your Latin is. Anyone going to tell me what endo means? Inside. 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 Dante? T. Exactly. So the, that, um, the diagnostic characteristic for this family are these structures inside the aperture, the opening of the shell. We call these structures lamellae. So you can see here there are like five or six of them. Over here there's three. And they're very consistent um, with the structures for the different species. So they're pretty cool looking, I think. Um, they're also epigeal. They uh, are primarily found um, in the leaf litter in the ground. Another Pacific-wide um, endemic, but everything in Hawaii um, is, is um, only found here. There are 33 described species, but Solom, this is a researcher from the mainland, when he looked at the Bishop Museum collection, found that there are possibly over 200 species. Most of them were dead by the time they got to them. One thing good about you know um, studying snails is that they leave their shells. So they leave um, uh, historical evidence um, so, so, so that we can study them you know, in the future and such. Um, unfortunately, there's only three species left, and we found two on Oahu and one on Nihoa. So that's kind of exciting. This this family isn't extinct yet. Um, there's three of them left, so hopefully we can uh, save them for the next couple of decades so that you guys can see them in the wild. They're really pretty in the wild. Punctids, um these are called dot snails because they're one millimeter. So if you make a little dot with the point of your pencil or a pen, that's pretty much the size of this snail. So the way we have to find this snail is um, we have to collect the leaf litter and store it underneath the microscope. So that is not as fun as going out and doing field work, but we still need to find these guys and try to save them. Um, the, as you can see, they look very similar to each other because they're one millimeter, right? They're pretty small, so it really is hard to distinguish species um, based on just a shell. But we've also found cryptic species in this family. So that's been kind of fun. Um, they are arboreal as well as epigeal, so some are found in plants and some are found in the um, leaf litter. Um, this is one of the more, as you can call, success stories. Um, so the last four families that I showed you, you know, a lot of them are going extinct, not, you know, doing very well. Um, this one, this family, we call them snot in the hat, because as you can see, uh, their little shell doesn't quite cover the entire body. So when you see them out in the field, you see this little slime blob with a little snail hat on top of it. They're actually kind of cute. Um, well, I think so. <laughs> but um, as you can see with the shells too, they look very similar with each other. So if you don't have the animal in them to see the different coloration, they pretty much look very similar to each other. So that's why with the help of genetics, thank goodness now, um, as well as um, internal morphology, we are able to distinguish the different species. And so we have a higher diversity of snails of this family than we thought um, before. So I know I'm going pretty fast, but uh, I'll be giving this presentation to you guys. So, But uh, um, anybody have any questions so far? No? Okay. Uh, so this is the only depressing case the hydrocinids, 
Uh, these are called cave snails because they're primarily found in caves. Um, it was last seen on Kauai. It is a Kauai endemic um, found in moss. Um, unfortunately, we have not found any. Um, and the last time it was seen is in 1930s. So we are still trying to hunt it down. Unfortunately, it's also about one millimeter. So we try to collect um, moss to try to find them. Um, and ho however, we haven't found any evidence of them. But we found really cool tardigrades. So if you guys want to study tardigrades, water bears, this is what we're getting into too. So hopefully one of these days we'll find a snail in these moss collections on Kauai. <coughs> And if anybody is uh, hiking the Power Line Trail in Kauai, let me know, because that's where it was last seen. Maybe you guys can collect some moss for me. <laughs> okay, so for the next couple of slides, uh, we're gonna talk about some really cool biogeographical concepts that um, you um, hear a lot of case studies in this class from plants, um, insects, um, and other um, organisms. Um, most of the fauna and flora of Hawaii, you know, um, they, the ancestors <coughs> evolved in other continental areas or other Pacific Islands, and then they flew here um, through birds, uh, wind or wings, that's what we call the three W's, that's the three major ways to get to Hawaii. Um, wing, water, and wind, right? The, the wings of the birds. So most of them, you know, once they've evolved the ancestors and then they colonized Hawaii, and then they radiated. So that's the majority of the cases. But there are some cases in which they evolved in Hawaii and then they colonized elsewhere. Um, do you remember which plant it was that we just... Um, just seen it. Oh, uh, was it a pot? Was it a pot? It's the money tree. Oh, the money tree, yeah. So that they found out that uh, evolved in Hawaii and um, went to other Pacific. So. This snail here also, uh, we're um, showing through the genetics is that it evolved in Hawaii and it has colonized Japan, um, parts of South America, as well as Juan Fernandez. So that's a pretty cool case study and so we're hopefully um, collecting more of these snails um, across the Pacific so that we can make this case. Another uh, cool biogeographic pattern is called the progression rule. So basically, this um, is where the age of the islands correlates to the older lineages. So supposedly, um, since Kauai popped up first about 5.1 million years ago, that got colonized first by things, right? And then the next um, walk, um, the next island that popped up was a walk about 3.7 million years ago. So things from Kauai very likely hopped on to Oahu and so forth to the big island, which is the youngest island, about 0 0.4 um, billion years ago. So these are some of the hypotheses that we can test too. So are the snails on this um, on Kauai older than the ones on the big island? And for some cases, it is true. In some cases, it isn't. So this is another uh, cool concept. Yeah, do you guys learn about the progression rule? Awesome. We will. Okay, good. I don't want to be like bombarding you guys with things like, oh, we're never going to be touching that in this class. <laughs> so this is a, a cool case study also with um, Hawaii. So you see that with these bigger snails, the Akakanella, they follow a progression rule actually. <coughs> so the ones on Oahu are much older than the ones on these other islands. However, for this little guy, that's not true. Um, so you see some of the older lineages on Maui sometimes, they're on Molokai, <coughs> and then they recolonize Oahu and Kauai. So we see that in um, genetics. Um, and you're like, how can they actually, you know, get around? They're pretty, you know, large in, you know, in some cases. And some of the colonization events is like from Japan all the way to Hawaii. That's a far way to actually fly, right? But in some cases, so this is a Japanese white eye. They did a study in Japan several years ago, fed this bird um, a relative of this snail here, and it passed through the gut, and it was still alive, and then it gave birth. So some of these snails are pretty hardy that it can pass through the gut of a bird um, and still pop out a live um, young. So that's some really cool evolutionary adaptation. So that's how you know some of these snails have gotten around, not just sticking onto the feathers, but actually being ingested and then pooped out later. Another uh, really cool 
about, about geographic hypotheses. It is a sort of passive dispersal. Anybody heard of this before or know what it means? Is that like floating on vegetative mats in the ocean? How, how would it be different from something that is not passive dispersal? So between those two, yeah, so passive dispersal is that it needs something else. It needs some other mechanism for it to disperse. It needs a bird, it needs wind, it needs water. It doesn't just migrate or just fly or walk. So um, most of the snails are passive dispersal. Um, <coughs> um, and so you can see with a lot of the littler guys, so the color of these branches correlates where, with where they are found. So for example, this species is found on Big Island and Kauai, and this guy is found on multiple islands. Well, this thing's about one or two millimeters, so they are small. So they do use the passive dispersal, so they use the birds to you know, get from island to island. But however, when you get a little bit bigger, that's about five millimeters here, you can see with these lineages, they're just one color. So if they get to a certain size, once they get to an island, they don't move. So that's really um, a cool pattern that you can see in different families of um, snails in Hawaii. So that's why a lot of uh, researchers um, back in the days used snails, not just in Hawaii, but on the mainland, to try to understand evolutionary, ecological, as well as biogeographic patterns. And uh, we are still using these snails to help us understand a lot of these concepts as well as these processes. So with the lands of conservation, you know, there's a lot of snails left. Um, people used to say there are only 90 percent um, extinct. Well, I mean, they only thought 10 percent was um, kicking around, so that's like 75 species. But so far, we found about 300 species left. Um, of course, some of them haven't been described, so the diversity used to be higher. So there's a lot um, that is left of this fauna that we still have to see. And we have to also remember the small guys. So even in the snail world, there is the um, the charismatic megafauna too, because these guys are much bigger and much easier to see, so they have a lot of the conservation and money poured into these guys, but a lot of people have forgotten about these little guys too. Um, and so I have a couple more slides, um, and we're going to talk about invasive species. So there are three major threats to biodiversity. The first one, does anybody know what is the biggest threat to biodiversity? <coughs> Humans? Habitat, humans? Habitat loss, exactly. So what's the second one? Invasive species. Impacts of invasive species. Anyone know what the third one is? I heard a whisper of it. Anybody? Climate change. So those are the three biggest threats right now that is uh, causing a lot of extinctions throughout the world. Um, and there's a lot of examples also in Hawaii where all three are causing um, havoc to our biodiversity. So we're gonna talk about um, some of the invasive species that we have here. So you can see this graph here. Um, I forgot to put in another graph, but this pretty much correlates with um, our, our, tri uh, our shipping and transportation. So just around in the 20s to the 50s, as we have built bigger airplanes and larger boats, and now we can have international travel with a lot of these um, uh, tools um, and wood and, and, and other things like that. Um, it's also increased um, these invasive species being spread throughout the world. And so we have about 45 established um, invasive species, and, we are, and they're getting introduced every single year. So Christmas trees. Every year we get them from Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. And so um, when they get to Hawaii, they shake the trees and they get the insects and the slugs and the snails and then they give it to us so that we can identify. And the majority of them, we don't have it in Hawaii yet. So then we have to pack up all the Christmas trees and ship them back to Oregon and, and the Pacific Northwest. So they're not very happy with us when we find these invasive species, but we don't need any more in Hawaii. So we call, so they sometimes call us the Grinch because <laughs> whole shipments. <laughs> get you know, shipped back, or they spray hot water on them, 
um, but unfortunately, they don't tell you that that they spray hot water in them, and then so a couple of weeks later, those Christmas trees turn brown. So apply local. That's that's the main message here. Um, unfortunately, we don't have I know the really poopy pine trees, but you know we we really don't need these invasive species because they cause millions of dollars in damage um, to our ecosystem as well as uh, agricultural <coughs> local farmers. Um, this map here, you see that the, you know the majority. Um, well, not the majority, but um, a lot of snails come from all over the world. People are like, oh, you know, the invasive snails that come to Hawaii, they're all, you know, from tropical places. You know, they're only going to be in these lowland elevational areas, um, you know, from Costa Rica. They're not going to be invading our um, higher up elevational mountains and stuff. But some of these are coming from Asia as well as Europe. They're temperate species, right? So they can withstand a large, wide range of temperatures from when it's snowing to it's super, super hot. And, and in Hawaii, as you guys are going to be learning, we have a lot of different types of ecosystems, a lot of different uh, elevational gradients. So they don't just stay in these lowland habitat um, destroyed areas. They're actually starting to invade um, upper parts of um, our mountains and also um, causing a lot of competition and diseases for our um, native uh, snails, but also eating a lot of um, our native plants. So one thing cool about Hawaii's um, snails is that they evolve with the plants. They don't eat um, seedlings. They don't eat live plants. They are decomposers or fungivores. So they keep our plants healthy. So when you're saying, oh yeah, we should kill the snails because they're eating our cabbages, lettuces, or our native plants, those aren't native. Those are all invasive snails. And uh, one thing that we do not want in Hawaii is called biotic homogenization. So there are two main processes for this. Extinction of your native fauna or flora. And then it gets invaded by these generalists, these general um, invaders that are very good at surviving all types of habitats and traveling and, and colonizing areas. And so we don't want our 750 species of snails become a community of 49 or 50 species. Um, as you know, we were talking about earlier, you know, what do these snails tell us about our ecosystem? Higher diversity means a healthier ecosystem. So we want to maintain our diverse um, native fauna. And so, um, I know that if you guys are bio majors, sometimes you need to do independent research. I think for this class, you guys need to do a project also. Um, so in the past, I usually get about one to two volunteers from this course to be helping me in, to, in, this, in the museum to help catalog, digitize, as well as his, um, assess historical and current distribution. So if you guys are interested in learning uh, you know, any of these things or just museum science in general, how to use Photoshop to plate a lot of these images, um, use digital equipment, then please let me know. Uh, we do have internships. You guys can also work in the vertebrate collection if you guys are interested in birds, mammals, reptiles, as well as a botany collection. So uh, we are all open for internships and sharing our knowledge uh, with the students you know, of the future, because you guys, as well as me, and this little guy, are the ones gonna be helping, hopefully, to conserve what is left of you know, the earth. And whatever that we can find first, it's all in these collections. There are these locked up information um, that is just you know bursting out to be shared with all of the researchers throughout the world. So if you guys are interested, just let me know. Um, you guys can email me. Um, I think Cindy. Yeah. Do you still find native for native uh, snails here if you look in your yard still? It depends on where you live. So um, his question is if um, we can still find native snails in our yards. Yeah. Um, so. On Big Island and Maui, in the high elevation areas where you still can live and stuff, you can still find native snails like Volcano um, on um, the Big Island. Oahu, um, not very likely. You'll find them in your yard. Most of the time, you find invasive snails. So, unfortunately, if you're here, whatever snail you do find in your yard, they're likely invasive and that. But you can try to kill them, but at this moment, there are so many of them in these lowland areas that is very futile. So what we're trying to do is save everything that is in these higher elevation areas now. So. And with that, we have a lot of people to help us. And so sometimes if uh, you stay long enough um, in the collection to learn about these snails, we take you out in the field too, because we always need a 
heavy um, field monkey. Um, also, if you guys are interested in genetics, we also need um, lab rats. So, and I didn't call them these group names. The students that have worked in my lab has called themselves field monkeys or lab rats. So we don't really call you guys that as an insult. <laughs> so, then we have a lot of um, people that helped us on these surveys and uh, put all of these um, data with us. And with that, anyone has any other questions? <laughs> This is, uh, this is on top of um, West Maui. So some of these places that we get to go to, it's we get helicopter drop on these um, top of the mountains to stay there for three days with no email or anything like that. So if you're stuck to your cell phone, you will go into withdrawal. But if you don't mind that, some of these places are still very spectacular in terms of uh, plant and uh, animal diversity. So. Any questions? Yeah. Um, you talked about like the high number of species that have gone extinct. What are the most effective like field conservation methods that are being implemented now to save the species that are still around? So right now, um, the main thing that we're trying to provide is a distribution and, and what you know whatever is left because, like I said, a lot of it haven't been um, studied for the last fifty to a hundred years. But once where we now know where they're located, um, there are still exposures. There are um, natural area reserves where they're all fenced off, right? So then now we can start flagging things where this area had the most diversity of snails, so let's protect these plants here. They're trying to um, replant a lot of these areas so that hopefully snails from the outside can start recolonization. Unfortunately, the hard part is in the lower or the mid elevational range, um, a lot of these snails have actually adapted to invasive plants like strawberry guava and ginger. And some of these are in the amastrids where there's 70 species left, but you wanna get rid of ginger. So what do you do? It's very difficult um, in trying to balance conservation um, and, and the cost. Um, up at Mount Ka'ala, that's on the highest point on Oahu, there is a sphagnum moss um, that is invasive, that is covering you know, the ground. So it prevents a lot of the new plant growth um, up in that elevation above. But we found this rare snail, 2008, it's called Ka'ala subvertia. The genus is Ka'ala. It was actually described from that mountaintop. It's the only species that, um, this, uh, that is in that genus, and it's on the ground. So what do you do? You're spraying the moss that you're trying to get rid of it, but that snail is also on the ground. You know, so what do you do? So, you know, these, uh, these are tough choices, but the conservation team here is trying to be more aware of the snails that are left and just, you know, do the best they can to do those things. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Well, thank him for also being very good this entire time.